Hey, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone can see me right now. So, this is Mayor Cummings, Justin Cummings, City of Santa Cruz. I'd like to welcome and thank everyone for joining this evening's forum on changing the face of community policing in the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprises the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. It's today working hard to restore the traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. In addition to our panelists tonight, uh, I'd like to um, welcome our city manager, Martin Bernal. Um, I'd like to welcome him and, and let everyone know that he's joining us. Uh, Martin, if you're out there, uh, I'd like to invite you to say a few words to the community. Yes. yes, hold on, I'm trying to open my, oh, there you go. Yes, thank, yes. You. thank you, thank you, Justin, um, very much. Uh, yeah, just very briefly, just wanted to say that um, I, uh, I understand and uh, appreciate the, the pain that the, the community and, and country are going through right now and, and acknowledge the, uh, the discrimination and inequities that we, that we have in our society, um, including in Santa Cruz. And as a, as a community leader, particularly a Latino community leader who myself have uh, experienced that uh, growing up and, and even in our community uh, and totally de dedicated uh, to uh, really doing what I can to uh, make changes and take actions that will move this in, in a positive direction to, to improve conditions. And, uh, but I'm, I'm here to, to listen and to understand and uh, to, to answer questions. And I very much appreciate you inviting me uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. In the, mur in the wake of the murder of George Floyd at the hands of four police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we've seen communities throughout our nation and the world speak out and demonstrate in opposition to police violence, especially violence against black communities. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd regretfully joined a long list of black Americans who have been killed as a result of police violence. Americans of all colors and backgrounds are angry and heartbroken about the lack of accountability and prosecution of police officers who wrongfully use excessive force on citizens, especially within the black community. The reason why people are screaming and saying black lives matter is not because they believe that black lives are more important than any other life. It is because the rate at which black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as high as the, rate, as the same rate for white Americans. Racism is something that is taught and has been ingrained in many aspects of our culture and in professions, including law enforcement and our criminal justice system. And although work has been done and is being done to change and eliminate racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of, dis of discrimination from our culture, there's still more that needs to be done. Last Friday, when the police chief contacted me regarding some of the protests that were being organized over the weekend, I thought it was necessary for our local government to provide a safe space for our community to share their feelings and provide recommendations on how we as a community can continue to do better and improve policing. So we decided to pull together this forum for our community in a way so that people could speak directly to their elected officials and police chiefs and do so while social distancing. To begin this evening, I wanted to start by letting everyone know that as we convene members of our, that as we convene, members of our community are still in the streets protesting and voicing their frustration with the uh, opposition to police violence in our country. I would like to thank members of the public who are exercising their rights to freedom of speech and I'd like to remind everyone who chooses to participate in actions to please make sure you're wearing your protective equipment and practice social distancing. We hear you, we are with you, we are taking this seriously, and that is part of why we did want to cancel this meeting this evening, because tonight we are taking steps towards taking action in our community. Uh, given that our meeting is in conflict with a 
protest that's currently happening on West Cliff. I want to start by sharing a couple videos that were submitted on behalf of the protest organizers and that they asked us to share with the community. And we want to make sure that their voices are being heard. We've also invited Joy Flynn Wall. She was the organizer of the action on Saturday in memory of George Flynn on the behalf. And after that, I'll turn it over to Santa Cruz Police Chief Andy Mills, who spoke out against the actions taking place by the, the Minneapolis police officers and took a knee with myself and the rest of our community at Saturday's action. So, so if you'll give me a minute, I'll um, pull up these videos that were sent by the organizers of uh, the action that's currently taking place. Time. Hello, my name is Isabella Bonner. I really wanted to start this video off by thanking Mayor Cummings for allotting us some time to voice our concerns within the community. Um, unfortunately, there was a site scheduling conflict this evening and there's a Black Lives Matter rally. So quite a few of the black and brown voices will be speaking there and unfortunately not be able to fully be heard in this discussion. Um, and we both thought that it was really important to kind of be able to hear from, you know, some of these community members really voice their opinions, especially surrounding the topics um, that will be discussed. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to present Mr. Stoney B. Gaudet, who has been a Santa Cruz resident for over 30 years and is very vocal and proactive in the community and has a lot of meaningful things to say. And secondly, um, I want to present to you Anthony LaFrance, who actually was courageous enough to speak over the weekend and spoke some really true words um, that I think the community needs to hear. Going forward, we are all looking forward to con continuing to have these hard discussions. Um, we really want to facilitate some meaningful change in our community, within the systems across America, and we're really looking forward. We're glad you're here. Um, yeah, and it all starts right now. So thank you for your time, and here are, here's Stoney. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Stoney, be good day. Taking a moment to say thank you for coming together, because it takes love for the community, love for oneself, to make a difference for others. This is the time for us to come together and be strong. This is time for us to put down our differences. This is a time for you to take away whatever fears you may have of someone that may look different, sound different, or act different. This is an opportunity for you to get to know that person and be stronger as an individual. Because as individuals, we come together, we be strong as one unit, one crew, one family. So be that person that makes a difference. As a father, of a son with on the autism spectrum. I'm concerned as he is a nonverbal male at the age of 19. Unfortunately, a lot of kids on the autism spectrum and with special needs or mental challenges are possible and more often being victims of the law enforcement because they don't understand they're not trained enough ahead of time so it's time to not blame anyone it's time to be positive proactive in the best interest of our future so the youth at this time step forward and make a difference and us adults it's time for us to put aside it's not me that doesn't affect me because at some point in time this may affect a family member of yours or someone you know. So right now, it's the topic about Black Lives Matter. But it may be your child, your family member, that is in this situation. And you want the community to come together for you, so it's time for you to come together for the community at this time. And the community that needs you right now is those of color. So Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. All people make a difference when they come together. So I challenge you to put aside your fears and get educated on how you can make a difference from afar or near. You can make a difference. Remember when you were a youth and you had fears, and as you got older, you learned to overcome them and make a difference. So be the difference. One community, one love. Thank you very much for your time. Have a beautiful day. Be blessed, be strong, be positive. We gotta unify just like this. Multicolored is. That's what we need on a higher scale. So when you leave here today, to let the people know that you made a change by being here. 
the biggest thing you can make is to find out that are not here. The ones that are not here are for a certain reason. Because they don't follow up to this. They don't believe in this. I was at work before, worked three hours and said, I got to be out, I got to be with my people. Not my people just for the black boys, but my people that represent and want to help the black boys. You understand? This start, the first time I got bullied was young, but the first time when I heard of Black Lives Matter was when a young boy died and got shot for Skittles. And we all know his name. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. Some of you already knew that. That means it's still in your life and your soul. It won't go nowhere. Same thing, 10 years later today. That was when I was 16. I'm 26 now, look what happened with George Floyd. Right? 10 years from now when my little son that's three is about to be 13, I don't want another story. I want positive change. Just positive change, not for equal rights, because we never fought for that. We're still fighting this day for civil rights. Yes! Not even equal, we've never been equal. Our ancestors, our grandparents fought for civil rights. Let's get there first. Yeah. No love, no justice, no peace. Yeah. Yeah, thank you again for the people who are organizing in our community and the people who are on this call who weren't able to make this call but who are wanting to make a difference in our community. Um, at this point in time, I would like to invite um, Joy Flynn Wall to join us. Joy, if you're out there and you can turn on your, your video and your audio. I have my audio. Um, it says that I cannot start my video because the host has not start my video. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Hello, Hello. everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor. Um, and I know you have a couple of questions for me, so if you want to ask away. Yeah. Well, first, I wanted to thank you for uh, joining us tonight, and thank you for um, the work that you did to bring everybody out for what was a really peaceful action that got captured and is, um, you know, being seen around the world. And so I just was wondering if you could start by just, you know, explaining to folks, like, you know, how this came about and um, how you organized this event. So I just want to speak, thank you so much, um, to the ability for one person to make a difference and while this was a few days in the making it was really years in the making um, I was mentioning earlier um, when I was speaking with chief um, I I'm very involved in the community and I have been I grew up here and um, I I think that that really played a role um, because there's pockets of people in the community who knew my name and knew, um, they know my heart and they know um, really what what I want is um, people to come together and I want, I want to see peace. So, um, you know, you and I had met a year prior. I had a couple of um, introductions with Chief Mills. So really, um, it, I don't think it would have been possible if it weren't for my... Um, active life um, in, in the community. Um, and I just was in a position of wanting to see something happen and nobody was talking about it. Nobody was saying anything. And I was, I was pacing in my home and just feeling really frustrated. And I didn't feel like for whatever reason with my own story of being a biracial woman um, that I had permission to start that conversation. And I think a lot of people are feeling like they don't have permission to start that conversation. And um, I had met with this group, Black Girl Magic Santa Cruz, um, one time, but that experience really um, helped me kind of come into my own um, 
courage, I guess, and feeling like I do have a valid story as um, a biracial woman and that I do have permission to um, start the conversation. And so while I kept looking at our our text feed and nobody was saying anything, I finally said, well, I can, I can do it. And so I just simply put, I'm going to be at the, at the clock tower at nine o'clock on Saturday in silent solidarity. And then they just caught the spark and then they sent it out. And then my friends sent it out, my friends and allies. And really what it was, was an opportunity to see in our community who our allies are, because that's who we need to um, access and use as resources at this time. And when I say the word ally, it's any person, any non-person of color that would be an ally, um, somebody who has you know, the ability to roam around um, the government, the United States, the, you know, our town and, and businesses in a way that, um, you know, somebody of color can't um, to really stand and defend us as, um, as a race. And so that was my call to action at the end of the action. And so thank you also, um, Mayor Cummings, for using that word, action, because while, you know, people were using the word protest and using the word rally, um, uh, I really, it was really a call to action. And I think people are ready to get, you know, down and dirty and, and tear this apart. And I see, you know, other um, races coming in, other um, minority groups coming in and really wanting to support people of color because, um, you know, black lives matter. And that's not saying that other lives don't matter. But the thing that people have to understand is that the, the systemic racism that we've experienced for centuries um, is the template in which they are um, experiencing oppression and um, racism as well. And so if we are able to laser focus on this particular issue, then it's going to break down the rest of oppression and marginalization um, as a country. So finding how we cannot get distracted and um, by other um, by other injustices that are real, but if we're able to really just laser focus on this particular issue and break that template, then we're going to create a new template that's going to trickle down to every other oppressed uh, person that's um, kind of where I was trying to go with, with Saturday. And um, I think, like I said, it was peaceful because that's the, it was grassroots, totally 100% grassroots. And because it was, you know, people telling people, telling other people, we were all telling the people that we knew the energy um, of what we wanted. And I just am very overwhelmed at how um, people responded. And thank you for being there. Thank you, Chief Mills, for being there. And I'm really excited to um, start this conversation. And um, I want to make a call to action to um, people of color and our allies to step out in courage and step out of fear and have a conversation, like really have a conversation. We're going to make mistakes along the way. We will. But it's important to um, forgive and and. Um, move move forward and allow um, people to make mistakes and um, learn from the mistakes so that we can really make a difference. It's going to be a long, long journey, and um, I hope that everybody has the stamina for it. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no, I, I just want to thank you for, you know, all the work you just said and then for all that the action that you've been doing, you know, and I think it's really important to highlight that, you know, um, it was just one, you know, post on one text that led to a gathering of hundreds of people uh, where there was a tone that was set that, you know, we wanted it to be peaceful, that we wanted it to 
you know, we wanted people to socially distance and, mm -hmm. so, you know, making sure that we weren't kind of cluster gathering in one spot. We were being mindful and lining up down Pacific Ave and just kind of riding through that, you know. Um, so I left my house and I got on my bike and I rode down Pacific Ave and rode past all the people who were silent holding their signs and it was just like really powerful until I got to the clock tower which is where I ran into the police chief and, you know, we were able to, you know, all take a knee together. And I think that it was just, a lot of people have, have told me about how beautiful it was. And so I just want to thank you and the rest of the organizers out there for everything that they're doing, the panel outs, the march that's currently taking place right now. And um, I just want, I hope that other communities can learn from, from our actions. Yeah, I think if anybody else is wanting to plan something, um, number one, make sure that you are already involved in the community um, and forge a relationship with um, elected officials and um, the police. Um, and then be very specific on what the idea is. Uh, and that was one of the other things that I did as I was, I said, this is what we're. This is where we're meeting. This is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. And it was very short as well, because um, I wanted to pe people to feel safe, just also for their health as well as their well-being. So, thank you for your support. Great, thank you. So with that, um, we'll continue moving um, forward with tonight's program. And I know that a lot of folks have asked, you know, what the city has been doing. Um, I'll let Chief Mills talk a lot about that. I did want to point out, though, that um, earlier this year, uh, Councilmember Clone, Crone, Glover, and I have brought forward an item uh, to prohibit the use and, limit and restrict the use of surveillance technologies that um, have proven to be biased against communities of color, which included predictive policing and live facial recognition. Uh, we've been receiving emails about these technologies and I just want to let folks know that um, these items uh, were sent to the Public Safety Committee back in March. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, we had to put a lot of city items on hold. Uh, but this is still something that um, we think is important to, uh, for our community in order to keep our residents safe. Um, moving on, you know, in the midst of this tragedy, I will say that I have been very much impressed by some of the actions that we've been seeing. In addition to many people who are coming out and protesting peacefully, um, I think that there really needs to be um, a highlight on some of the actions that have taken place in Minneapolis. Unlike uh, other cities or other times when we hear of people of color being shot, we see videos of them being um, choked to death. Uh, this was an instance where immediately after uh, this video was shown, uh, it was known that the four officers involved were fired. They weren't paid to put on administrative leave. Um, they were, you know, they lost their jobs because of this. And as of today, all four of those officers are in custody and have had charges pressed against them. We also saw throughout our country that there were um, police officers and police chiefs who were standing up and speaking out against the killing of George Floyd and the actions that were done by those police. And for me, this is what hope looks like. It's what accountability looks like. This is what we protest for and why our elected officials need to work with the community and the police officers to begin implementing change. Um, I'd like to thank all the officers in addition to our community members who are speaking out across the country, including the members of the Santa Cruz Police Department, our Santa Cruz community, and I'd like to thank Santa Cruz uh, for playing, the police for playing a role in supporting the community as they um, are taking action in our streets. Uh, with that, I've invited Chief Mills to join us this evening uh, to talk about some of the things that um, have been changed in our police department in terms of how, how our police officer, how our department functions. Um, and after uh, Chief Mills speaks, we'd like to open it up to the community to be able to ask us questions. We've had some people write in questions. We've had other members of the public who are on the line, and we will um, be allowing people to speak uh, you'll have two minutes at that time to speak. You'll need to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand in the meeting. And again, um, we want everybody to be, you know, this is an opportunity to speak to your elected officials, speak to your police chief, so please be respectful. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Mills. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, community discussion on the police, on racism, on use of force, on technologies that affect all the above. And uh, I think that when I saw the murder of George Floyd, um, my reaction was visceral. It was um, pain. And I think that uh, for me, what it was is the ultimate breaking of the spirit. Um, not only Mr. Floyd was broken, but I think police officers, including me, all of the nation were broken. And I think that that's how you begin to build a different system, is when you get to the point where you've hit rock bottom and you feel like you've, you've, hit, the, you've hit the pit, that, you've, that the only place you can go is up from there. And so as a result of that, I felt it was important to speak out uh, as a police leader, as a cop for 42 years, and clearly state that what happened there was not only wrong, it was murder, one, and number two, that we have some enormous problems in policing and the justice system in, in specific that need to be fixed. I can't control the whole justice system, but I can certainly control what happens in my police department. And so my responsibility is to control what I can control and influence what I can influence, and it begins with me. And, and everybody across the nation begins with them. And uh, I am pleased to say that I've seen police officers from all the nation, including my own department, who have been posting online, who have um, come up to me personally with tears in their eyes and said, thank you uh, for taking a knee, because we have to do better. And this is where it begins. If it doesn't start here, it'll never happen. But we can't settle for shallow symbolism of taking a knee. That's important, but we have to do more than that. There has to be policy, there has to be law, there has to be procedure, but most importantly, there has to be a change of heart. And that can only come internally. And so um, I'm hopeful that some of the young people who are now policing our cities understand race and culture and bias better than we did in my, in when I started. And this hopefully pushes us in the right direction uh, to bring systemic change so that black parents don't have to explain to their black teenage kids how to prevent getting shot by the police. But that can't be acceptable in our society. And so I'm committed to change. And so here's a couple things uh, that I'd like to start off the conversation with. Today I issued an order uh, to my entire department that we've changed our policy and we will no longer use the carotid restraint, also known as the chokehold. It's done. It's gone. No police officer will use it in Santa Cruz anymore. And I feel strongly about that. My command staff felt strongly about that. We've been discussing it for some time. But when we saw uh, San Diego and Watsonville also ban it, and now other cities are falling in line as well, uh, it's a low-hanging fruit, but it's a good place to start. Uh, we don't want to put our people in a position where they're taking the life of a human being because it was applied incorrectly. And so uh, that is done. But let me also uh, mention a few other things that I think are really important. For the last two and a half years, we've been hyper-focused on de-escalation. Uh, we recognize that not all the police shootings that take place need to take place. And we can do better by uh, giving it time, talk, and tactics to reduce the frequency of when the police use lethal force. Uh, as a result, just this year, we've probably had five different circumstances where officers would have been justified in using lethal force, but they elected not to and were able to talk people down or use other means to get them to stop uh, using a weapon. This is how change happens. It started with policy and then it went to training and now we have action and reward for that. We've done some other things that I think are really important. We've instituted critical incident training in our department, where we teach our folks how to speak with people and how to calm people down rather than spin things up. Uh, this is a critical element in, in working with our community. But I think the most important thing we can do is work shoulder to shoulder with our community. Uh, when we are in step with our community, working with our community, talking to our community in a real and meaningful way, that's when change happens. It's pretty hard to 
not like somebody who's next to you and that you know really well from working with them. And so uh, this is an important uh, topic and conversation in our department and our officers are getting it and uh, we'll continue to do this um, even more in the future. As we move forward in our community, we want to hear uh, from the community members. You know, we got some really smart people in our department, but we also have some really smart people in our city. And we want your input, we want your direction, we want your influence on our police agency. And so that we're policing from your perspective. Uh, we can only uh, learn that if you're communicating with us. So as you know, I have a 9.30 to 10.30 on Monday mornings. People can come in and, and sit down and talk with me. I would love to hear your ideas of how to reduce our police use of force or uh, improve our relationship with the community and reduce racism. You can also email me directly at amills at cityofsantacruz.com, amills at cityofsantacruz.com, and give me a call uh, also at 831-420-5816. And let's talk about it. Uh, because we have to be better uh, to make sure that our community is headed the right direction. Look, we're not perfect. There is racism. There is bias, whether it's unconscious or overt. And we're trying to weed that out of our organization and policing in general. But I can tell you this, we are going to give it our best effort. And I expect you to hold us accountable uh, for that uh, because this is far too important. If we don't fix this permanently now, in 20 years, we'll be right back here again, just like we were about 20 years ago with Rodney King. And we can't afford that uh, as a country. We can't afford it as a community. We certainly can't afford, it, afford that as individuals. We have to uh, treat all of our brothers and sisters better than this. Uh, those are just a few of the things that are going on, and I could probably go on a lot longer, but I wanted to uh, make sure that we answer all the questions in here from the community as well. Um, we're also moving forward with, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, reducing the, um, uh, that we are not going to use and have not been using for a while, uh, predictive policing, but it will now become official city policy or law, and then also uh, live facial recognition technology, because uh, we just don't want to be in a position where we're using that to harm other uh, communities of color. So having said that, um, I'd be happy to take uh, you know, questions or comments or whatever you think first, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thanks, Chief Mill. Uh, I had a question and maybe it could be for you and possibly the city manager as well. Uh, I know that employees uh, receive and, and council members as well, uh, receive diversity training um, upon being hired. So just wondering if you could speak to the kind of training, um, maybe Martine at the city level and then um, Chief Mills if there's additional training that police receive around diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, yes, sure. I'd be happy to answer that question. Yes, it, it's a it's a requirement that uh, all um, employees who are, are uh, management or supervisors in the city are required to take uh, uh, diversity uh, training um, and uh, 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 harassment prevention training uh, and uh, uh, discrimination uh, prevention training as well. Uh, and they, you do it uh, when you're first hired, and then you have to redo it uh, every few years. So it's an ongoing training that happens on a recurrent basis for new employees and ongoing employees, and those employees also get promoted. And also it's available to all city employees in the city. So we have quite a few employees that take the, the program uh, on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, in addition to that, uh, we do uh, actually an incredible amount of training um, in our department uh, for uh, to guard against unconscious bias. So uh, one of the trainings that we just sent people through is implicit bias training uh, to make sure that uh, we're looking at ourselves. We know that we all bring bias to these positions, these jobs, just by the way we're, we grew up or we were raised. And so we're doing that training uh, to increase um, our understanding and awareness of implicit bias training. Uh, we've also, just before COVID hit, um, had the diversity center was going to provide some training as well uh, so that we're understanding LBGTQ issues and doing much better at that. There's a lot of training both planned and uh, delivered and so we need to uh, continue to um, uh, do more uh, to continue to sensitize our people towards uh, the things that uh, uh, can drive uh, 
race and uh, racism, prejudice, and bias, uh, whether it's conscious or, or overt. Thanks. The other thing, if I could just add one more thing, uh, the other thing that we do have in the city is we have a, a EEO committee, an Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, uh, who is uh, comprised of different uh, employees from different sectors of uh, the organization, uh, different employee groups, uh, as well as the, the community representative, who also focus on uh, identifying, you know, representation in our in our workforce, and who make recommendations related to. Um, policies as well as training uh, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. So we have a, a, an ongoing committee that focuses on, on those issues as well. So I thought I'd point that out too. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Chief Mills, we've had a lot of people writing in kind of asking about um, mutual aid and the fact that there have been uh, Santa Cruz, the pictures of Santa Cruz police and Santa Cruz sheriffs at the Oakland protest. And I was just wondering if you could kind of speak to what, you know, what's happening there and, and maybe talk a little bit more about what mutual aid is. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair uh, question that people are asking. And it's a concern of theirs and it's a concern of ours as well. In fact, I've been having a conversation with Chief Watt, uh, Chief Honda from Watsonville and Chief McManus from uh, Capitola and some of the other police executives about uh, uh, taking a look at the policy under which we send people and to make sure that we're is implementing the correct oversight if we do send people on mutual aid. So it happens in the need of disaster, whether it's man-made or um, nature. Uh, we, are, uh, we rely on other jurisdictions to help us get through those. So for instance, the earthquake that took place in, in Santa Cruz. Um, that's a disaster that goes beyond the scope of the police agency who's there, and the fire department as well, or a natural wire, wildfire that's consumed thousands of acres. You need help, and you just can't do that on your own. And so when things got out of control in Oakland, uh, they contact the governor's office through Cal OES, Office of, of Emergency Services. They send an order down uh, to the sheriff of the county and the sheriff contacts the local police agencies telling us what the need is, and then we send people uh, to those locations to help them uh, restore order. It's not to manage a protest. It's to restore order when there's a riot. And that, that's a very clear distinction. And what we did, because we, were, we did send a half dozen officers, two sergeants and a lieutenant, um, what we did is we wanted to make sure that we had somebody from management there to make sure that we were not going to be enforcing people who were peacefully protesting. Because that was the case, I want that manager to make the decision to pull our team out and leave. And so uh, our man we had a manager uh, go to that location and uh, report back to the deputy chief who was reporting back to me on a regular basis about how it was going. And just to give people the scope of what was going on, as soon as the officers arrived, the first officer that exited the vehicle um, at the direction of Oakland uh, got hit in the arm with an object and uh, we thought it was broken. <clears throat> Turned out that it wasn't broken after x-rays, but there was some serious violence taking place. And that's why they were there to help um, uh, stop people from rioting, uh, not to um, prevent people from protesting their God-given right uh, to do in their First Amendment. So that's the purpose of mutual aid. And I wanna be in a position where if we have uh, something where we need help from other agencies, that I can pick up the phone and call the governor's office and they'll respond. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, I remember hearing about like Paradise Fire, for, for example, where you, know, you had fire battalions from all over the state that were trying to, you know, provide that kind of mutual aid from that instance. And so um, thanks for helping me clarify this to the community, you know, how mutual aid works. Um, next question is one that we had emailed in to us, um, and the person says, in AB 392, peace officers, deadly force, passed in August 2019, it states that a police officer may use deadly force, quote, when the officer reasonably believes deadly force is necessary. What is the protocol for making the distinction that deadly force is deemed necessary? Well, that's a pretty broad question, but uh, let me see if I can explain it this way. Um, first of all, that's AB 392 was just passed. I uh, talked to Dr. Weber, uh, the, the um, assembly person who wrote that bill. I met with her in her office and, uh, and had a great conversation with her, uh, seeing how I could help 
uh, her uh, managing to pass this bill because it was going to be dead on arrival. And, uh, but she ultimately got it through, not because of me, but because um, uh, she was tenacious about it and, and got it, it pushed through. We had a great conversation for almost an hour, and I think that was, it was helpful for her to understand the, the police side of it. The, um, uh, in order to use uh, lethal force on someone, there has to be a threat that is going to uh, either do injury, life-threatening injury, or death. And that, and by, and that, by the definition of the law, has to be eminent. It has to be, the, th the force you're gonna use has to be re what's called reasonable and necessary, but it also has to be eminent. And then it defines what eminent is. We've gone a step further in our policy. Not only does it have to be reasonable and necessary, it also has to be an immediate threat. In other words, it's not a threat that is likely to come. It has to be a threat that you're responding to immediately to save your life or somebody else's life. And now what AB 392 does is it also looks at the surrounding circumstances around that event and looks at it, could you have done something else to prevent it, which is where our de-escalation training comes in. So if there's a threat, uh, you or somebody else that is um, likely to cause great bodily injury or death, then you have the right to use lethal force. You're muted, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Chief. Um, and then just a follow-up to that question. Um, when officers violate the law set in AB 392, uh, which, as we mentioned, is to control the use of deadly force, how are they criminally liable, or I guess, you know, how are they held accountable uh, to ensure that justice is enforced? So if, uh, if an officer violates the law, uh, first of all, let's start with the, the investigation. The investigation is actually done by the district attorney's office uh, with a lead investigator from our department. So uh, take it out of the department. We have the district attorney's office take the lead on that. So there's some once removed level of objectivity. Once that is done, uh, the investigation is done, it goes to the district attorney. He determines whether or not there was a violation of the law. If there was a violation of law, then he determines, uh, or she, but it's in our case, it's a he, uh, whether or not to issue the case uh, and to prosecute the person. The only other option, two options they could do is a grand jury, a criminal grand jury, or else go to a coroner's inquest, uh, which is not done very often. The mechanism really isn't there. Um, but uh, they have not had that circumstance in our county, at least recently that I know of. And, uh, but it can, it, and it does happen around the, around the nation. Um, I got a question from one of the attendees. Um, they're interested in understanding and whether or not you know, Chief, um, about how many people have been coming out to the protest in Santa Cruz these past couple days. Uh, the first, um, the first protest that uh, Joy so wonderfully organized uh, was probably around a thousand people. We're estimating. We just don't go every person and count them. Uh, we can only do an estimation based on uh, distance and space and compaction and all that kind of thing. But there's about a thousand people there in my estimation as well. Uh, some of our folks think Saturday was as high as 5,000 people. And I don't know what it was today, but I can tell you this, I'm sitting to dream in uh, that protest and ran over here to get on this, on this call. And all I know is that there were streams of people on West Cliff Drive that were, it was thick and it probably lasted a half hour, I'm looking at my staff here. So there had to be thousands of people. We'll get an estimate a little bit later, but there's a great level of interest in our community, uh, which is an active community anyway, in uh, seeing and uh, speaking out against uh, uh, injustice when it comes to race and police uh, and police abuse. Great, thanks. Um, I got a question on here. Joy, if you're still on the line, I was gonna see if I could ask you a question real quick. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, so one of the members of the public asked, where, I, where can I find information on becoming a part of the group Black Girl Magic? Um, well, she can um, DM me on Instagram at Assemble with Joy, and um, I can give her that information. 
Great, thanks. So I'm going to ask one more question um, out of the question box for now, and then I'm going to see if folks want to actually um, kind of um, call in and, and either ask a question or if they have any comments to make. Um, but the, the last question I'll ask before we go to the phone lines, um, and for people who are on the phone and listening, if you press star nine on your phone, that will raise your hand, and then we will be able to um, click on your uh, phone and icon. You'll be unmuted, and you'll hear uh, that you've been unmuted. You'll have two minutes to speak, and in the background, you'll kind of hear this um, siren going off, or alarm going off, I should say. And what I'd like to ask is that you please uh, be respectful of the two minutes because we want to try to get as many people uh, on our lines as possible. And so with that, um, the question that came in from Mia Patton, I feel like the most difficult aspect of changing the way we police is actually being open about our biases and how we perceive each other. Is it wrong to acknowledge that there's a silent veil of brotherhood that keeps officers safe even when they break the code of ethics and morals? So if I understand the question correctly, it's is there, is there a uh, blue coat of silence that protects one another? Um, well, yes, there is. And um, I think we have to acknowledge that, that uh, there is some level of a blue coat of silence. But if I can just give a couple of other points to that. Uh, most of the sustained allegations that I have that come in that you know we approve uh, when a citizen complains or a, there's an a investigation that we're doing an internal investigation, most of the sustained serious allegations come from other cops. It doesn't come from the community. And so they're willing when they see something that's egregious, at least here in Santa Cruz, I can't speak for everywhere, uh, to come forward and speak. But generally speaking in the United States, yes, there's a blue coat of silence. I think it's frequent in professions. Doesn't excuse what the, the police do it. So I know doctors, I've talked to a friend who's a surgeon that covers for other surgeons and teachers and you, because you want to believe the best of the people you work with. You don't want to think of them poorly. Uh, but that doesn't negate or excuse or equivocate our responsibility in policing especially because we have so much power uh, to make sure that we do this correctly. And, uh, and so that is something we talk about with our people. It is something that uh, we have to train about and also um, counsel about. But so, yes, thank you for that question. You know, I actually have one other really good question that came through that I think other people have asked, and so I'm going to ask this one and then go to the phone line. Um, but what's your view on creating more independent oversight for Santa Cruz PD? And I know that other folks have asked about, you know, police review boards and different things like that. So. Um, maybe if you could see, and I, if, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think at one point in time there might have been a police review board in Santa Cruz, but it, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, if you can speak to that. Yeah, I think there was a police review board at one time, and I think by most estimations it didn't work very well for a lot of reasons, and it was well before my time. So maybe somebody who was here at the time could speak about that. Um, I'm not opposed to um, civilian oversight. Uh, the question is, what's the best model uh, to use? And what's going to be most effective uh, in controlling the behavior of the police officers uh, that they're investigating if, in fact, they're sustained allegations? And um, is it subpoena power? Is it an outside independent review like we currently have right now, um, uh, who's a former U.S. attorney, uh, Civil Rights Division, is who we're currently using as our um, independent reviewer, Mike Giannacco. So there's um, a variety of ways to do it. I just had a conversation with a couple of my colleagues here in the county uh, to have this discussion about how do we do this in a thoughtful way. One of the suggestions, or at least broad thoughts, is to have this discussion with each other about coming up with a system uh, that makes sense uh, and is consistent throughout the county. Now, that's as rough as it is right now, but we determined to have a cup of coffee next week over this and really talk about how do we bring change in that way. And um, so it's very beginning stages. And of course, there's a political process. We'd have to go through the city council manager's office to actually change what we currently have. And so again, this is very shallow level. Uh, but I think that um, in policing, we're at a point where we recognize that uh, 
that there needs to be something much stronger than what we currently have. Great. And then just to follow, can you maybe tell folks a little bit about the current um, independent reviewer and kind of how they function with the police department? Yeah, so how it works is uh, we have three levels of complaints. Uh, one is an inquiry, somebody has a question about our policy. When I saw an officer do this, is this correct or is it not correct? Sergeant can handle that in the field. When they, when they have that, they type up a little memo, it goes to internal affairs, so we can track those. So if we're getting this consistent complaint on the same person over and over, then we, need, we know that we need to do some training or there's an issue there that we have to deal with. The second level is um, a category two complaint that is a violation of policy or discourtesy, um, a fairly low level um, offense, if you will. The uh, person's direct supervisor is responsible for investigating that. They write an internal affairs document and we're bringing in uh, Pete Rodney, uh, who's a lawyer uh, who does a lot of these uh, investigations for other uh, local jurisdictions to train all of our folks um, as soon as the COVID crisis is lifted and how to do those supervisors' investigations and how to uh, determine and make sure that the person's rights are protected, but at the same time, uh, do a complete thorough investigation, holding us to the highest standard. And then the most serious offenses, uh, prejudice, use of force, or criminal activity is done by an internal affairs section. Uh, Scott Garner is responsible for that. He reports directly to Bernie Escalante, a deputy chief. Uh, and uh, he does those investigations and keeps the deputy chief apprised all along the way of the, of the investigation as it's going. Once that's all done, uh, it comes to me for review, and then we forward it over to um, Mike Giannacco, as organization, who is the uh, former U.S. Attorney Civil Rights Division, uh, to review the information, to uh, evaluate it, to give us critiques on what we might do better uh, and whether or not he agrees or disagrees with the investigation. We also use him as a sounding board throughout the process to make sure that we are headed the right direction. So we're just not um, winging it on our own. So that's the process uh, that we currently use. Uh, it's certainly not perfect, but uh, we feel it's a pretty good process. And I, I look at the academic literature on this uh, from Sam Walker University of, uh, of Nebraska at Lincoln and some other folks who, um, we think that that's probably one of the better ways to do it. But uh, you know, I'm open if there's other ways that are more effective. Great. Thanks, Chief. Uh, with that, uh, Martin. If I could just add uh, really briefly as far as the uh, independent uh, police auditor and the structure that we have in our city, one of the, the things, of course, is that it, it is independent, and that means independent of the police department. And so the, the police auditor reports to the city manager and the city council. And so the uh, auditor reviews, obviously, the complaints, and then if there are any issues or concerns, uh, raises them to the city manager's attention. Um, I supervise the police department, the police chief, and also to the public safety committee of the city council. Uh, and there's a report uh, that gets reviewed, and, and the council gets an opportunity to review the complaints and to provide feedback uh, in response to that. So, and then, of course, that the public also has access to the public safety committee. Uh, so there's a public interaction component that goes with that as well. So, uh, anyway, so that's the overall structure of how that works. Great, thanks, Martin, for that update and clarification. You're welcome. Okay, so at this point in time, I see there's a lot of members of the community who uh, want to speak to uh, the chief and myself. And so, again, if you'd like to speak, uh, press star nine on your phone. Um, when you are unmuted and allowed to speak, you'll have two minutes. Um, and if you go over two minutes, we'll kindly ask you to um, please wrap things up. Um, and then if it goes on any longer, I'm gonna have to mute you so we can ensure that the people who want to speak have an opportunity to speak. And so with that, we'll start with our first caller. Hi, I don't know if it's uh, working yet or not. Oh, it is. Okay, great. Um, first of all, and uh, this may cut into my minutes, but I think I need to do an introduction of myself and also explain why I'm here. Uh, my name is Dara Aro. Um, I think plenty of people know me here. I've been a chef in the community for many years. I also um, do quite a bit of farming and things like that. 
Um, more relevant to this specific conversation, Chief Mills, Mills, it's nice to see you here. I uh, grew up in Humboldt County, so I'm familiar with your record. Um, as well as some of the issues uh, from the past county. On top of that, I was also present for the action that happened in Oakland. So with all that said, I would like to say that I appreciate you and Mayor Cummings for having this conversation. Um, and I would just like to talk about a few topics, which are that um, black people are still disproportionately arrested in Santa Cruz despite having a ridiculously low population. I also think that we have an incredibly high number of misdemeanor arrests in this county that are too high. Um, I'd like you to speak briefly to um, Santa Cruz's participation in the actions of brutality towards UCSC grad students during, during their uh, strike actions. Um, I'd also like to talk about the fact that riots and protests are happening right now regardless of COVID. So waiting for training to happen post COVID seems a bit late, um, especially while we're in a crisis across our country. Um, I have some qualms about this conversation happening during an action in Santa Cruz. So there are people that had to choose between participating in this discussion and being on the streets. And I'd also like to know your opinion on the Santa Cruz action being peaceful, not because of who showed up, but because of who didn't. The um, department did not send officers in riot gear for this, and Santa Cruz is full of white people, similar to the Women's March, which did not much in actual policy changes um, and seemed mostly just for uh, calming down people's frustration. Um, Eureka had some problems with an old guard that is very aggressive, that likes fear of civilians. There were some uh, police shootings that did not really get resolved, and I guess I would just like you to speak about that a little bit, and also on your position sure. I'm gonna have to stop you because... versus riots. Thank you. Uh, Chief, I'm wondering if there's any um, pieces of that you might want to speak to. Yeah, I'll try to unpack a couple of them real quickly, because uh, I know there's uh, 131 questions uh, still there that uh, we have to somehow get through. Um, let me first talk about the UCSC uh, protests. Um, we did help out uh, university police. Our primary role was just traffic, uh, controlling the traffic in the area and, lot, and facilitating, uh, again, protests. Uh, it's a mutual aid request from the UCSC. They, current, they frequently come down to help us in the city as well. Uh, all the uni blue uniforms you saw were mostly uh, California Highway Patrol and other university systems people from all over the state. They bring them in. They brought in a lot of people. Uh, for that, but uh, we normally sent like two or three officers, I think as high as six one time on overtime that the state pays for to control traffic. Um, without the officer involved shooting um, information that she was speaking of in Humboldt, you know, I don't know which ones uh, per, per se that she was speaking of. Um, uh, the ones that uh, I had one while I was there and uh, that was resolved and so you know, um, I, I don't know really how to how to how to answer that. You know, per se, but I do hear very clearly about you know making sure that if we're going to uh, go to Oakland for the purpose of or any other city for the purpose of a riot that it needs to be a riot, and that's why I send a a, 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 a ranking officer with them to make sure that we're doing that, not just uh, policing people who are protesting. Thanks, and I'll just speak to again the um, you know when this meeting is being held and just know that um, when we tried organizing this back last Friday so that I wanted to give the public enough time so that they knew that it was happening, I found out about the, the protest that was taking place today, yesterday morning. Um, we put a lot of effort in trying to get the message out to the community so that we can connect the community and you know really have an opportunity for people to address um, their elected officials and the police chief. And I think it's really important that, you know, one, in addition to people, well, I should just say that in addition to people protesting and asking for action, that government and their police chiefs are taking action. And that's what tonight is. Um, I don't think that we should wait until all the protests are over. I think that we need to acknowledge what happened and start taking action as quickly as possible. And so, um, 
I had a conversation with the organizer of that protest. They agreed that, um, you know, that we should both move forward, and um, which is why we gave them the voice. And we want all of your voices to be heard, and there's multiple ways for voices to be heard. Um, protesting in the streets is one of them, and showing up here tonight and speaking to us is another. And just so folks are aware, this video will be is being recorded, and it will also be available to get distributed um, on the internet or however you feel, uh, however you seem fit. And again, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can email me, you can call me, myself and the chief, um, jcummings at cityofsantacruz.com, and happy to hear what you have to say, and we will take it into consideration. Okay, so we'll go to our next caller. Congratulations to your uh, wise actions that prevented uh, prevented things from getting out of hand. So where do we go from here? Uh, I'm wondering about hiring policies because you seem like you have some good ideas on training. Uh, I know in the past that we had uh, points given for veterans, uh, preferential points. I'm wondering if people that were trained to deal with confrontation with violence is the pool that you want to be favoring to have as police officers. I'm also wondering if there's any kind of testing for PTSD, which could lead to people with short fuses, uh, if there's any credit given to people for training, such as in psychology, sociology, in other words, nonviolent problem solving, uh, credits in university degrees. Uh, also, you mentioned some of the use of force issues that you're working on. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to see that. And uh, also psychological profiling. You know, there's a, a small number of people as we have unfortunately seen in some of these videos from the demonstrations that apparently become policemen so they can bully and push people around for whatever psychological aberrations they unfortunately have. So I'm, I'm talking about screening people that get hired before they get hired and making sure they are appropriate people to be police officers rather than trying to correct the problems they cause after the fact. Thank you. Well, Fred, boy, those are all a lot of very good points, and uh, my assistant is here taking notes, and uh, we'll take them back. In fact, my deputy chief, uh, who helps me do all the hiring, is sitting here also, and I can see on his face that uh, uh, we have some work to do. So we do screen people, uh, uh, and we do psycho a great deal of psychological testing. It's a, actually a pretty brutal test. Uh, that uh, You fill out the hundreds and hundreds of questions, and it's MMPI as well as some other things. That, uh, that uh, then they use to doubt an interview with a police psychologist who uh, comes back and tells us whether or not the person would have the tendencies to be a person who's gonna be abusive. And so we are doing that. I don't know how effective it is because you see some examples around the nation of people who are pretty brutal. Um, and the, I think the riots and the tension that is caused by that, you can see people overreacting in some ways. So um, that has to be, to be better. Um, I'd be happy to talk to our human resources uh, division to make sure that uh, if we can offer hiring points for things like people with advanced de-escalation skills or advanced communication skills or training and something that could help us uh, de-escalate and diffuse uh, the incidents that we have, I think that's a marvelous idea. And uh, so we will absolutely check into that. 
and see if that's something that we can uh, be as part of the hiring process. When we go through our uh, questions, we ask the, we, you know, through the interview, we ask these very kinds of questions uh, to people. You know, have you been in a very stressful or violent situation before? And how did you, what, tell us what happened and how did you work through it? And what we're looking for is for them to tell us that they were able to successfully de-escalate. Um, and that's, you know, one side of it. The other side of it is, um, it takes a lot of cops to go through the system, a lot of applicants to go through the system to hire just a handful of people. We screen about 1,100 people a year through testing processes, and we hire about 20. Um, so it's a pretty difficult uh, job to keep a police agency fully staffed and um, with retirements and people moving on and going to other agencies and so forth. Um, and now we're in the midst of a budget crisis on top of it. So, um, but uh, those are great ideas. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, next up we have Matt Simon and after um, this person speaks. I think we're going to take a five-minute break. We've been on um, for about over an hour now, and some people, knowing that some folks might need a, a quick break, um, we'll take a break after this next speaker. Okay, so Matt Simon, you just muted yourself. There you go. There we go. Um, all right, so I um, wanted to ask what the police and Santa Cruz police department is doing to um, to make change. You said, you know, kneeling with protesters is the start of it, and I'm glad, but, um, you know, just to show of solidarity isn't enough. Are you speaking up through your police unions to make changes that make it easier to hold police accountable so that they can't use the reasonable fear clause to get out of murder? Um, are you speaking up to steer money away from police departments, including your own, um, to go towards other services? Um, help it, help for the homeless community, help for low-income neighborhoods that could manage these conflicts better without police in them. Um, and finally, I wanted to ask, are you, what are you doing to address violence started by the police at these protests, including in Oakland? Um, you know, I, I, I feel sad that you're, that an officer was, you know, attacked with, you know, someone throwing something at a Santa Cruz officer, but these protests are turning violent because police are showing up with full riot equipment. Well, let me let me address these in reverse because that's how my mind works. Um, uh, first of all, uh, these the situation in Oakland was violent hours before we got there. Uh, we don't go when we're expecting a violence at these things. We go when it's already beyond the capability of that local police agency. And so there are already fires, we're already looting, there are already massive amounts of people who are injured from uh, from a handful of protesters who are, uh, or of, of rioters who are using a peaceful protest uh, to, uh, to cause anarchy. And that's not acceptable, and we can't permit that in a free society. So um, that's already taken place. Uh, as far as what are we doing, I just announced one tonight, even though it's a, it's a baby step, of, uh, of preventing our officers from using a carotid restraint or a chokehold. Uh, and it's gonna take those kinds of changes to make sure that we're not doing the things that are going to cause people to die. And there's a lot more that needs to be done. Again, this, these are just the first steps. And I am having conversations with my colleagues around the nation. I was phoned yesterday with uh, the chief of police in major cities. I've been on the phone with the Police Executive Research Forum. I've been on, and we've been highlighted what our department has been doing. Um, so we are doing everything we can to influence the profession. That's why I'm speaking out so loudly and so clearly um, nationwide uh, so that uh, people understand exactly where I am. And it comes with a cost. I've had lots of people private message me and, you know, and use uh, epithets. But I've also had a lot of people private message me and tell me that they're grateful that somebody is speaking up. And I'm amazed that a lot of my colleagues from San Diego who are black, almost every single one of them called me directly and said thank you. But again, if we end at shallow symbolism, we've, we've completely failed. We need systemic change. 
And I am doing that by speaking out amongst my colleagues, by creating the right policies internally, by educating my officers. Um, and, it's, and it's beginning to work. Um, today at the protest, the folks that are out there, um, I had 18 officers, 18, asked to be part of the protest. That would never have happened in most cities, including this city. Uh, because they're, they're, they're beginning to understand that we're not apart from the community, we are part of the community. And that's where the change has to come. The biggest thing, if I'll, and I'll close with this, that we absolutely have to do, and we are committed to doing internally, is neighborhood policing. And here's why. When you work with people, shoulder to shoulder, when you're solving common problems with one another and you find success, how do you hate that person? Part of the biggest issue we have is the separation of all of our ethnicities, of all of our communities of color, of all of our LGBT versus heterosexual. It's, there's so much separation and the only way you can bridge that is actually working together. And that's why we're committed to continuing this, by working with the community to solve these problems, to find actionable things that we can do. And um, I think Vice President Biden talked about this uh, just the day before yesterday, that there really needs to be real community policing. When President Clinton announced the crime bill in 1993, I flew out to New York, and I, was the, I represented uniformed law enforcement in speaking uh, at when he announced the crime bill. Now, the problem with the bill as it was is they gave 100,000 cops and most of those police agencies didn't do one bit of community policing. They put them into rapid response and put people in jail. And the jail swelled and now we have the problem we have today of over-incarceration. So we have to do community policing right if we're going to do it. And that means working with the community. And you know what, sometimes you get feedback from the community that's not very comfortable. Well, suck it up guys and gals. Uh, that's part of that's part of dealing uh, with uh, with people who actually have an opinion about stuff. So thank you for your question. And you know, one of the things I'll just add to that um, to make sure that we highlight in this is that so some folks might know there's a list that's been floating around the internet, and it's, it's five demands on what people can do to police better. I just want to point out that number three of that was refocus police resources on training de-escalation and community building. And, you know, I think if you've been on the line this whole time, or if you're just joining us, you know, one of the things that's been pointed out is that de-escalation training is something that Santa Cruz is already doing and that we're committed to doing. So a lot of the recommendations that we're seeing online are some of the things that we're already implementing, and that's why we're also having this forum so that we can hear more from the community on, you know, what else we can do. Uh, with that, it's uh, 7.13. We're going to take a short break, and we'll come back at about, um, about 7.20. So uh, please stay tuned. We're, we're going to take a five-minute break here, and we'll see you all in a couple minutes. Mia, are you on the line? Okay, I guess not. Um, Let's move to the next speaker. This is Hello. Um, first, the first thing I would like to ask the chief is if he would be willing to expand the department policy to include a duty inter to intervene in examples of excessive use of force. I noticed that the policy laid out a uh, an encouragement in terms of bias-based action, but not in terms of excessive use of force. And I think that that could really improve our police department. In addition, I saw that there was an updated carotid restraint policy, which is great. And I was wondering where the policy for de-escalation was also. Um, if you could point to that at, or point that out, that would be great. I see that it is encouraged, but not dissuaded in terms of mental illness. But how does that apply to community, community members in general? Where is that line delineated specifically? And lastly, I have questions about the social media policy, specifically the Facebook page. I believe that the chief mentioned he had a goal of lessening implicit bias, but I do believe that some of the um, posts 
of um, seemingly individuals under arrest, arrest that are seemingly charged but not prosecuted can lead to increasing social stereotypes in our community. Um, there is, simply by photographing someone, you transmit their, um, their cultural group, their identity, and this, when, crime, when primed with a crime alert, also will lead to more stigma in our community and increasing implicit bias. So I was wondering if that could be addressed as well. I think I, have, I think I have most of what you asked for. Uh, so again, let me start with uh, the reverse. Our social media is uh, handled by our public information officer who does a phenomenal job keeping the community informed. And uh, we have a lot of people asking us for information every single day. And, uh, but I appreciate you bringing up the fact that we need to be careful, very careful about increasing stigma and, so, and bias by, on what we post. And I will speak with my PIO. Uh, Joyce Blotchke, uh, to make sure that we're doing this in a thoughtful way, but yet also still being transparent as an organization and letting people know what's going on. It's always a difficult balancing act to make sure that the community is adequately informed or doing it in a way that uh, is not stigmatizing or um, uh, unduly prejudicing uh, either cases or people. Um, as far as our um, crowd restraint, uh, it is it was updated today, um, and because I we made that decision today, and that's already online, so it's been completely removed, uh, saying it's no longer authorized in our department. Uh, De-escalation is trained that we have done. I don't know if we have a uh, a policy in our actual policy manual on it, but we do have a um, uh, standing operating order. That, uh, that designates that they uh, shall de-escalate and the training mirrored that. And, uh, and on top of that, we also reward people for de-escalating uh, events. And so there's a kind of a Mas Maslowian uh, hierarchy here where we try to uh, encourage people to do that. And uh, so far it has worked well. Uh, and look, I need to be honest, it may not always work, but that's the expectation for our officers is they do everything within their power uh, to de-escalate these as much as possible. And I'm missing one of the questions. Um, oh, duty to, uh, to uh, intercede or intervene. And there's a very clear policy uh, on that. It's in the 300 section, I believe, which is the use of force section, that they absolutely have the uh, responsibility to intervene in excessive use of force. I'll look at the language and see if we can clean that up a little bit. <clears throat> we get it from Lexapol. Uh, it's a service that gives us our policies, but I'll make sure that uh, it's what, everything that we need it to be. And beyond that, our conversation with our officers on a regular and ongoing basis is if you see it, you own it. If you see something take place and you don't inter intervene and you don't intercede or intervene in that action, it's as, it's as though you were doing it yourself. Uh, that's pretty clear to all of our folks. And, uh, and I think that they, that they get that. But thank you for your questions. All right, we're gonna try to, um, I'm gonna ask the public, given how much time we have left, um, if we can keep our, our um, questions to about a minute and try to you know, focus on maybe what's the most important question you'd like to ask at this moment in time. And if you'd like to follow up with this, you can always email your questions, but wanting to hopefully get to as many people as possible and a lot of people have their hands up. So um, we'll move on to the next person, Mike. Uh, you'll have a minute. And so if you have a question for the um, chief or any comments you'd like to make, um, we'll unmute you now. So Mike, you should be able to unmute. Hello, you're on the line. Okay, I'm here? Yes. Okay, good. Chief and the mayor, thanks for uh, an opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I was, I've been listening to a lot of this, and, I, and I, there's a couple of things I've seen completely absent in this, and that is complimenting the millions of peace officers who are out there doing a great job every day. Uh, seems like a, a parade all about a few bad ones, and there's always going to be bad ones. Uh, I was just curious, uh, after seeing what I've been seeing in certain big cities, uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, 
if this anarchy is, is helping a cause or making it worse, that's one thing. How are we helping to make things better for uh, their cause? And I'm curious about, uh, does the media outlet cover the death of like a white man that's in custody and has, has died at the hands of the police? I don't, I don't ever see that. So just kind of curious why we're kind of getting differential treatment here. And uh, those, are, those are just some of the things. I, I, I've got a, quite a few things which upset me, but I'd be curious about that. Uh, I'd like to see your PIOs at all agencies start to stand up to the officers and start setting the record straight because we're hearing a lot of stuff that did really occur. So anyway, just listen to that and think, please. Right. Chief, I don't know if you want to follow up on that at all. Well, I can follow up on the last part. I really can't. Um, I don't have an opinion on whether it's helping or hurting a cause. You know, somebody else can answer that. Uh, but I can tell you this, that the media does report, and we do get sued when somebody dies in the custody of the jail or the police when uh, the person is not a person of color. And, um, and I don't think that the lawyers that are out there who sued could care less what the person's color is, and neither does the media. Um, so it does happen regularly um, where uh, people are held accountable for that or question, tough questions are asked, and that's how it should be um, because the taking of a life or the death of a, of a human in our custody is something we take seriously. And, um, and so we want to make sure that that's done. And just let me add, there are about 750,000 police officers in the nation. Of the 750,000, um, you have a city of 750,000 people, would you expect there to be some level of crime? Well, the answer is yes. And so uh, among 750,000 cops, there's going to be more than just one or two bad apples in the country. There are several. And it's our job as police leaders to ferret them out and to get rid of them. Now, there's some, it's diff, it can be difficult. Uh, there's, there's labor issues, there's union issues, there's police officer bill of rights, there's all kinds of, 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 of rights afforded to them, which we absolutely believe in and that, uh, that they need. But if you want the chiefs of police to clean this up, they've got to be given the ability to do it. And, um, and that's one of the things that uh, nationally we're gonna have to take a good hard look at. But uh, by and large, the vast majority of police officers out there who I would lay my life down for uh, any day are honorable, kind, generous, um, thoughtful, careful people who are the top of the heap. And if you follow our uh, social media, both Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, we try to show regularly, almost every day, the great work that our officers and men and women are doing. And they do a phenomenal job. And so uh, to answer Mike's question, yeah, uh, if you follow us at all, you'd think you'd know that. All right, uh, Jacqueline, next caller. You can unmute yourself. You. There we go. Hello. It's good evening. Me? Okay, Hello. good. You. I thought you'd pass me over completely. All right. Um, I'm concerned that about the use of deadly force instead of disabling force. Can you comment on, couldn't a lot of times police shoot a hand or an arm or a knee, and of course that would be terrible, but it would stop the person from having to be killed. I'll mute myself, and thank you. Thank you for your good efforts in, in all this. Thank you. So, yeah, so Jacqueline, uh, that's a fair question that we get actually pretty frequently. Um, and I maybe have two comments for you, and there's other people who are even more expert at use of force than I am. Um, uh, if you're going to use the level of force to shoot somebody, it better be so egregious that you have to stop that threat immediately. Missing three times trying to hit a leg or a hand or an arm, those rounds are going down range someplace. 
and who's going to get hit by those? If, if, if my officers are going to use that level of force, they must stop that threat immediately. It has to be so grave that they have no other option. Uh, other than that, then we're torturing people by maiming them, and that doesn't make any sense. Now, what we're teaching our folks to do is to, rather than using their firearms at all, is to de-escalate this through using shields, through using 40-millimeter uh, extended impact rounds, through using tasers, through using talk. Uh, that's a much better option than maiming people, and uh, we, we do not permit that. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, next caller, you're on the line. I think this is George. Hello, Chief uh, Mills. This is uh, PD volunteer George Stadji. Um, George, I wanted to make. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, you know, Chief knows how much I love him, and I love the police department and my PD volunteers. Um, and I just can't wait to get back in there. But you know, something. Um, Mayor Cummings, you are just an awesome dude, and you're doing a great job for our community. And I just, I just think you're you're awesome, and I appreciate everything you're doing. Um, and, I, and that's all I wanted to say. And uh, I love my community. I've been here since 1972, and I just think the world of the Santa Cruz. And thank you for all you're doing. I love you guys. That's all. Thank, you. thank you, George. We appreciate it very much. Thanks. We love you too, Georgie. All right. Uh, uh, I think there was an individual named Scott. Scott, you're on the line. Hi, this is Scott Graham. Um, I have a few suggestions here. Uh, Demilitarize the police. Uh, what, is, what is the police department doing about profi racial profiling? What about harassing the poorest members of our society endlessly? Uh, Reinstituting a police review board. Uh, use of force. Who has the ability to fire an officer? Is it only the chief? Can the city manager fire somebody? Can the city council fire somebody? Um, more non-lethal options. And give us back the parking for the post office on Water Street. Over and out. Thanks, Scott. All right. This is Clara. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Great. Um, so I am wondering, knowing that Santa Cruz has been putting their police officers in Oakland and in Alameda County, with knowledge that Oakland Police Department um, used tear gas and rubber bullets 20 minutes before curfew after a youth-led protest. I'm wondering if you're not going to pull out your police forces in Oakland, what are you doing to actively prevent police brutality in these spaces? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, I understand your accusation. I don't know if that was done or not. Um, if you're telling me that was done, then I'm, I'm assuming that that to be the case. Um, but like I explained earlier uh, on this broadcast, one of the things I'm doing is sending a, a high-ranking member of the department with our officers uh, to make sure that if there's something untoward or that we're being used inappropriately, that uh, we pull our officers back immediately. And uh, we've sent them twice so far, and that's it. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue to evaluate it uh, based on need, and, uh, and we'll go from there. All right, next caller, Tom, you're on the line. Hello, I'd first like to note that the district attorney works hand in glove with the police on an ongoing basis. And as the mayor said, you can't really be an adversary of someone you sit beside every day. How will you ensure that there is a sufficient level of separation and independence between you 
to ensure that the DA will be objective in serving the needs of the community while investigating any offer accused of improper, accused of improper use of lethal force or any other wrongdoing for that matter. I also would like to commend you, Chief Mills, for being willing to command your officers to no longer choke people, but frankly, that sounds like damning with faint praise. You need to reform all use of lethal force, not just certain methods. It must be the absolute last resort. <clears throat> and this is especially crucial for people who are suffering a mental health crisis, like Sean Arlt, whose life was taken by an SCPD officer four years ago because he was holding a rake. And for that matter, you need to end the militarization of the SCPD overall, including the Bearcat. The impression that you are an oppressive paramilitary organization that's prepared to crush anyone and everyone at every, any time only serves to alienate the SCPD from our community and destroy the trust that they have in you. Thanks, Tom. All right, next speaker, uh, looks like you're on the line. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, Chief Mills, one of the main complaints of Minneapolis residents is that just 8% of their police force live inside the city. Um, people who patrol places where they don't live or pay have historically been called mercenaries. Cities without residency requirements are shown to have more violent police outcomes. Um, I wasn't able to find any data on SCPD residency, just that we don't have a requirement. So I'm wondering how many of your officers live within the city of Santa Cruz? If you don't know, are you willing to make that information public? And Mayor Cummings, would you be willing to support a residency requirement for a certain percentage of the police department? Um, I also want to say cost, cost of living, is on the tops of people's minds. I've seen your starting salaries, and I make do with less than your newest officers. So that's not really a reason um, to not require residency. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start um, by speaking to that because I, I – so when growing up in Chicago, if you are a city employee in the city of Chicago, you have to live inside the city limits. And when I first moved, and if Martin Bernal is still on the line, maybe he can speak to this as well, but when um, I was considering you know, running for council and I kind of first got on council, one of the first questions I asked was, is there any requirement for, is there any ability of, of cities to require their employees to live within city limits? And my, my understanding is that at the level of the state of California, that that's not possible. So, that's it. so, Martin, I don't know if you could speak to that at all. Uh, yes, there, there, is, there are legal constraints uh, to that uh, at the state level. Um, however, you know, we do encourage, obviously, and, and would prefer uh, for our employees to live in the city. Overall, I can tell you that overall city statistics, we have quite a few, relatively speaking, um, compared to you know, many other areas. Um, I don't have the statistics for the police department, but you know we do have officers that live in the city or in the county. Quite a few employees live in the county as well, and uh, so relative to many other departments, we have quite a few. We can still get the statistics. I don't know if the chief Mills has the statistics for his department, uh, but we don't. We can't legally be required to do that. Yeah, when there, just recently there was a person who came forward to uh, to discuss about building uh, housing that uh, might be able to, you know, host some of our police officers just outside the city limits. And um, so we were taking a look at that. We pulled some data. And if I, you know, I might be wrong, but if I recall correctly, it was about 60% uh, of our department was within 10 minutes of the building. And um, I could be wrong on that, but that, that seems to be what the number was. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's statistically higher incidents of officers using force um, if they, for when they don't live in the city. Uh, I have never seen a piece of research like that. If you have a piece of research that says that, uh, please email it to me, and I would like, love to take a look at it and, uh, and see what we can do. Um, it, and it is difficult for the officers to live in the city uh, with families and the you know, cost of living and housing that, uh, that they choose to live in. Uh, so it can be difficult. And, uh, but uh, many of our officers do live here. They were raised here. They went to high school here. They worked at uh, the Seaside Company or you know, other, other places in town. And, um, and so we do have a lot of people that are from Santa Cruz. Just to add, I can tell you that uh Having worked over the hill uh, and coming to Santa Cruz, uh, it was a big change for me. Uh, even when I moved into the city, there were, and there still are quite a few officers that live in and around my neighborhood. 
Uh, whereas when I worked over the hill, you know, most employees of cities lived in other cities. Um, so that is something that I think uh, we, we do have a little bit more of that with Santa Cruz. All right, we'll keep moving down the line. Shaka, you are on the line and you can unmute yourself now. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I have a uh, question slash uh, comment. Um, I'm African American and I was pulled over on my bicycle. This happened a couple months ago. And I have no record and I'm an Iraq veteran. Um, I want to know what I can do about uh, cops that profile. If I lodge a formal complaint, what will be done on your part to remove this officer if need to be? So if you file a complaint on the officer, uh, that's a category one complaint as we talked about earlier. That will be assigned to our internal affairs section. Um, they will um, uh, talk with you, interview you, and then they will talk to the officer, interview the officer, and then they'll pull the body-worn camera uh, footage uh, and examine that and then make a determination based on those three things, unless there's more evidence that we could collect, uh, to make a determination. If, in fact, the person was uh, profiling you, that's unacceptable, and the appropriate discipline would be meted uh, to the officer. Uh, and then and we, we evaluate that on what's the best way to uh, either improve this officer or get rid of this officer. Now, you have to remember our investment in an officer is a couple hundred thousand dollars by the time they are on their own. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to train people properly to not profile and treat people like you, an Iraq war veteran, uh, with disrespect or, or uh, suspicion that's inappropriate. Okay, Jasmine, you are on the line. Hello, um, actually Jasmine's husband, Reggie. Um, I just want to rank about something. Um, the communities of color, activists like Black Lives Matter, Black Visions Collective, and others are loudly and clearly saying that we need fewer police, we need them less on, and uh, we need the money that they have to be invested in uh, their communities, which have been divested due to historical structural racism. Um, police have giant budgets right now. Santa Cruz has a $30 million a year police budget, and just a small amount of that could go a very long way, uh, helping low-income communities, homeless communities, and uh, communities of color uh, more generally. And so I guess I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, as long as reforms, in terms of reforms, reforms have been tried. Minneapolis itself tried many reforms, uh, body cameras and community review boards. And so, with, uh, Thanks, Reggie. Okay, next caller, your last, the last four digits are 1835. graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. And um, one of the things I'm seeing circulated a lot right now in um, the Santa Cruz media are stories about when our police chief reported a firefighter for wearing a Black Lives Matter pin while he himself was wearing a Blue Lives Matter bracelet. Um, I want to know if that's a belief that he still holds, um, and if it is, then how he reconciliates that message with the solidarity showed by kneeling with protesters. So first of all, thank you for the, uh, for the question. And that uh, was an event that took place about uh, four years ago. And uh, on our uniforms, you can see uh, that we don't have a lot of things uh, such as pins and badges and things like that 
that could that would bring controversy to the uniform. If someone wants to wear a Black Lives Matter pin or any other pin, uh, then they cannot do so on their uniform uh, because we have uniform standards unless they ask for permission first. The firefighter wearing that uh, did not ask for permission from his fire chief. And his fire chief and I were sitting next to each other uh, in council chambers at the time. And, uh, the fire, and the fire chief talked to him about that and ultimately asked him to remove it. And that's what took place. Um, I approved, my officers came to me and asked for a variety of things to wear on their uniforms, some of which I felt were inappropriate, whether it be religious or um, Second Amendment, uh, I, the list could go on and on what people wanna wear in their uniforms because they have an opinion about things. And I, if I open that door and permit it, then it becomes problematic. I did approve our officers to wear a wristband on their arm, not on their uniform, on their arm that said Blue Lives Matter. And the reason for that is five officers had just been slain in Dallas. And uh, the community raised money to send three of our officers to the funeral in Dallas, and they got to go. The ones that didn't get to go were able to wear that, uh, that uh, wristband uh, for a while. If someone comes to me and says, Chief, I'd really like to wear a, a uh, Black Lives Matter or anything else on their wrist, they're more than welcome to. Uh, in fact, I would encourage it. I was just standing with a crowd of people chanting Black Lives Matter because I truly believe that in, in all of its historical sense also. Um, but as far as putting stuff on uniforms, if I open that door, uh, that, that becomes Pandora's box. Even, even no matter how much I agree with the person who wants to post or wants to host something on their uniform. And I've had all kinds of requests uh, come to me to wear different things on their uniforms. And we, we generally say no. But it's something I would consider if, uh, if in fact, um, it would benefit uh, a community and we do it in uniform as a department and not just a one-off person deciding that they're going to do something without informing the boss. And by the way, that firefighter appealed uh, that, uh, that decision by the fire chief and it was up, upheld by the Civil Service Commission. And Chief, I'd just also like to point out that I, um, I know that this month being uh, the celebration of Pride Month that the Santa Cruz Police Department actually came up with their own badge um, with the rainbow flag in the background standing in solidarity with um, the LGBTQ community. And so I just wanted to make sure that the public was aware of that as well. Now, one other thing I might add, uh, Justin, on that is um, uh, we had a local artist doing Black Lives Matter in Santa Cruz. Um, uh, art show, and um, other than the uh, Center for Nonviolence, the Santa Cruz Police Department was the first one to host that art show in our building as a message to our personnel. And lots of people came in and were able to take a look at her beautiful <laughs> with stories of African American people and the struggles they face, including with the police, uh, in, in our own building. And it was a powerful message. And so um, I strongly believe that black lives do matter. And um, uh, that was just an incident that took place with a, with a pin on a, on a uniform that just didn't belong there. Okay, all right, I'm gonna open the lines back up. We only have about 10 more minutes. Um, so we're gonna hope to get through a lot of uh, these calls, but encourage folks to send in their questions if we can't get to you. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions tonight and I know that um, some questions have been asked multiple times and we've been able to address those. So also try to um, find this, this video online. It will be posted on the city's Facebook uh, page, and we're also gonna try to get it up on the city's website for those people who don't use Facebook. Um, but we'll move to the next caller. So this is Patrick. If you can unmute, there you go. Yeah, hi there, thanks um, for holding this forum. Um, I have a fairly specific question um, that, um, kind of looks at training and um, biases that might be happening um, within the, the police force, and this is obviously for Santa Cruz, but um, I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Um, um, I recently learned about a training program and authority that um, is used by numerous police departments throughout the country 
Um, and I'm curious if the Santa Cruz police use um, this training program. It's uh, called the Bulletproof Mindset by uh, Lieutenant Colonel, what's his name? Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. Grossman. Yeah. And um, everything I've learned about it is appalling. Um, his pseudoscience of killology um, really seems to underlie the phenomenon we're seeing of cops being excessively violent. Um, and I'm wondering if Santa Cruz uses his trainings, and if they do, um, I'm going to strongly encourage that we need to scrub that entirely from uh, Santa Cruz's uh, training. And then if we're not, um, what are you doing to encourage other PDs to not use his training? Thanks. Yeah, so I'm familiar with Dave Grossman, and uh, he's um, very popular in police circles overall. And, uh, but we do not use this training in Santa Cruz. We have not used, uh, uh, at least since I've been here, I don't know of any training that we've used that, uh, that deals with his, his books and so forth. Um, uh, that's about all I can say about that, other than um, I try to exert my influence uh, as a police chief with my colleagues around the country as often as possible. That's why I write a blog it's not only targeted for our community, but it's also for policing in general. It's chiefmills.com. I would encourage people to uh, uh, to sign up and to uh, get uh, alerts as it kind of lets you know my thinking and what we're trying to do as a police agency. And I'm always welcome to take feedback from people. Just shoot me an email directly. All right, we're going to go to our next caller. He's been unmuted. Next caller. So you, you want to unmute mute your phone. And this is Hari Krishna. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, barely. Maybe you could speak in your phone a little bit closer. Uh, yeah, I can try doing that. Is it better? So that's a little bit better. Okay. Um, yeah. So I have a lot of respect for the police workers in Santa Cruz, and I understand um, what the chief was saying about restoring order um, against riots versus managing protests. Um, but the thing is, a lot of us have, um, have seen reports and, and videos of, of excessive police brutality, even against peaceful protesting. Um, and I think that's eroded a lot of trust in the community. I think many of us understand that not all cops act like this. But enough do that make us lose our trust in the policing system, even here in Santa Cruz. So how do you effectively plan to restore that trust? Because it's going to take more than just um, promises of reform to do that. Yeah, you know, when I start out my, uh, my discussion, I talked about being broken. And I think that uh, uh, intellectually, emotionally, that uh, this has really taken the wind out of sails of a lot of police officers as well as police agencies. And I think that's the first uh, spot to start. You know, we, there really needs to be a lot of humility uh, of policing, of me, uh, to start learning and listening to people. And it's, it, you're right, it is going to take time to rebuild trust, to rebuild confidence of the public. Again, if we don't do this in a thoughtful, systematic, and powerful and expeditious way, then we lose our ability to be the um, defenders of justice for our communities. We can only police with the community's consent. We can only police with the, with, when the community uh, believes in us. And, um, and I get that that's been eroded. But again, the policies, the laws, the planning, the training, that all has to take place and has to be in a visible way for people to actually see and, and touch and understand. And then last, we need to work with people uh, on an intimate and personal level. And that's why we're doing neighborhood policing here in Santa Cruz. It's just not a platitude of community policing and throw a program out there of some kind and you'd reach 10 people a year. We're actually trying to solve problems with our community members. And uh, that's where people um, build that trust. And many people are listening uh, on this on the show right now that, um, that have worked with us and continue to work with us. We've got almost 40 volunteers, 40 people who give up their own time to solve community problems. And that's a powerful way to begin. To call people who are shut in at their own home during COVID-19 and unable to get out, taking them food occasionally, 
uh, talking to people on the phone, checking in on them, uh, looking for vehicles that have been stolen and parked. Uh, they're doing an amazing job. And that was just one example of many that we're doing uh, to, uh, to help bring uh, this city uh, closer together and work with people. All right, next caller, you can unmute yourself this time. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yep. How you doing? Hey. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah. So I like your idea about being able to wear a bracelet that says Black Lives Matter on it. You said it uh, seems like a great idea. It would be great if you um, could lead the charge on that and uh, start wearing that and uh, lead by example. It's the first statement. Um, a question I have is um, that well, obviously we sent police officers uh, to Oakland. Um, it's Police violence is a systemic issue, and when we send our officers there, we are uh, entirely um, complicit in um, that systematic uh, problem. No matter um, how you know nice we are as a community here, we are involved um, actively. Um, you said earlier that you didn't know if we were uh, conducting any uh, violence there um, as our officers. Um, but early in the conversation, you mentioned that you were getting reports back. Um, I'm a little confused about that. Um, I want to know if we can get any more information on how many officers have been sent to Oakland, how many officers are currently in Oakland, and what you are doing to personally ensure that we are not conducting police brutality there, like so many other officers are. Thanks, Nick, for those comments. Um, I'm going to see possibly if the police, if the police chief's office can maybe get back to because we've touched on that subject a lot, and I want to make sure that we, in the last couple of minutes, we give a couple people a little bit more time to speak. Okay, so next speaker, you're on the line, or you can unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Karima Spencer, and I'm a member of the community. And I'm wondering, uh, body cams have been men mentioned several times, and I'm wondering if um, police officers are required to have their body cam on uh, when they make a stop or any interaction, and if not, if that could be our policy. And then also, if the officers turn their camera off, is there a penalty for that? Those are very good questions, and yes, it's uh, by policy that any uh, enforcement contact of any kind, the officer has to have their body camera on or they're doing an investigation. Uh, they need to have it on with their certain limitations. For instance, uh, a sexual assaults, we probably don't want to record those and make the person feel that they can't tell us uh, intimate details and have it recorded. So there are some limitations, but overall, they absolutely have to have them on. When not have it on, uh, they receive discipline. And, uh, and on top of that, I have our sergeants randomly pull uh, traffic stops to make sure that officers are wearing uh, their body cameras and that they have them on. Um, and that they're recording on all those stops, that they're not shutting them off prematurely, uh, and they're, they're not missing uh, valuable pieces of information. So we do an inspection process uh, that, we, that I implemented to make sure uh, that they're wearing uh, the body cameras active when they're contacting people from the community. Not only the officers, but the rangers and the CSOs as well. Okay, I want to be respectful of our time. Um, we've asked for, we've had this um, going on from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. this evening, and I want to thank everybody who was able to come out and join us on this call this evening. Uh, Chief, is there anything, and, and I would like to also say that We've got a lot of questions um, for some folks. I would encourage you to you know, watch parts of this um, webinar again because many of the questions that have come up have come up multiple times and have been answered. And also for those of you who uh, were unable to speak on the line tonight, please email us your questions and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and Chief, I was just gonna see closing out if there's anything, any final remarks you had to the community. Yeah, I do want our community to, uh, to under, I do want the community to understand how seriously I'm taking this. Um, this is a huge movement that is taking place in our country. And if we don't capture in this opportunity to really make a difference, a systemic difference in how we police and how we relate to one another, um, we get a lot of calls, for instance, of a black man walking down the street. 
and I asked NETCOM not to send us those calls. That man has as much right to walk down the street as anybody else. Why on earth are we going to send white police officers to go talk to that guy? Not too long ago, uh, I was walking downtown with a, one of my deputy chiefs, and a radio call came out of two black men selling CDs on Pacific Avenue with some writing on their shirts. I was close by, and I didn't want an officer to handle it, so I walked over there and talked to the guys, wonderful guys, just selling CDs, and their shirt said, "End white slavery now. Do we want our police officers to actually contact these folks? Absolutely not. This is the kind of change that has to come, and it has to come from the community as well, the people calling in those complaints. And, and it has to come from the policy of saying, we're not gonna answer those calls for service um, because that's unjust. And I can go through a lot of these and, and tell you on all races and all kinds of things. But the bottom line is, in order for there to be real change, it has to be systemic, not just in policing, although that's critically important. It has to be in the court systems. You ever heard a judge to, uh, speak out about how they're making changes in the court system? It has to be in probation and parole. It has to be in the correction system. It has to be in the education system. It has to be in the health care system. And if we don't fix all those things, we will continue to have problems of violence. But I can only control what I'm responsible for. And I'm telling you, with my last breath, I'm going to make some changes in the Santa Cruz Department. It's a big ship that doesn't turn easily. But at the same time, it's time to uh, thrust the rust to the side so we can get it turning. Thank you for the opportunity, Mayor. Yeah, no, and thank you for being on this call with us. I think that many folks, and I know that there are many folks from other communities who were joining us tonight or have reached out because they want to see these, um, this video and, and see how this conversation went. And so for people who are on this call from this community or from other communities, I would just encourage you all to, you know, whether it's you're, you're encouraging your friends who live in other cities or whether you live in another city, um, get your elected officials to meet with your police chiefs, get them to um, commit to making changes and try work and work with them, right? Um, everybody's been out um, protesting and everybody has been making their voices heard and it's now when we need to take action. Um, the chief and I, I spoke with them the other day and we're gonna be working together on writing a letter to the League of California Cities, the National League of Cities, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors to let other mayors uh, and elected officials know and these organizations know that here at Santa Cruz, we're taking this seriously, we're doing something about it, and we need to get everybody on board now because um, we've seen this happen time and time again. Um, we see people go out to the streets. We really don't hear of any changes happening. And um, given the situation that we're in and our ability to work together, uh, myself with our chief, the community, um, we want to do something and we're going to do something. And so we ask you to please let us know how we can help. Please let us know how we can do things better. And we'll be continuing to bring policy forward that um, helps our police and our community uh, live and work together in a way that's peaceful. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Please feel free to email us, and um, we'll be able to, you'll be able to find this video um, on the city's Facebook page. Uh, we're going to try to get it posted to the city's um, website, and then if you'll bear with me for a minute, um, you can also email citynews at cityofsantacruz.com if you'd like a copy of the video. And with that, thank you all. Take care. Stay safe and have a good evening.